This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. Let's sit here quietly until she shows up in our Zoom room, Josh. Do you want me to pull out a calculator and give you some numbers? Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, everything you ever wanted to know about navigating student loan repayment. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 132. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Dan, episode three of the Pandemic Files. And week a million of being away from civilization. <laughs> Roughly a million. That's right. How is isolation and quarantine treating you? Uh, I keep starting projects, which is a good thing and a bad thing because I'm not really finishing those pro- like house projects, things around the house. So... I decided one day I was going to dig a pond. I think I mentioned that. And then last week I decided I was going to tear out a deck. So that's been exciting. That's a big job. Yeah, they're all big jobs. It's not a sensible way to approach uh, staying at home, but... It's not like I'm going to reorganize my dish towels or something no, like that. No, I, I should hang pictures on the walls. I've lived in this house for four or five years now. It seems like I should do something to finish a project, but all I want to do is start things outside. Well, it's a beautiful time to be outside. If this drags into the heat of summer, then you can focus on those indoor tasks. How about that? Sounds good. Now, what are you working on? I think I mentioned this last episode. I'm just doing the the best I can to look at the silver lining of this and make the most of it and take advantage of things I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. been spending a lot of time with my kids, for better or worse. We went fishing the other day. That was That was really fun been catching them up on the great movies from the 90s that they have not seen yet to make sure they are well-versed in those. All the things that you grew up on? Yeah. Introduced them to uh, the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, Space Jam, Indiana (laughs) Jones, you know, the classics. (laughs) I was worried you were only showing them bad movies from the 90s. Oh, no, these are the best. These are the best movies. Are they old enough to watch Clue? That's one of my favorites. Yeah, you know, uh, we watched Clue. Uh, Clue, I believe, was on Netflix, and we watched it about three weeks ago, and they really enjoyed it. I didn't know if it would hold their attention, but they loved it. Oh, it's very fast-paced, but there's quite a bit of murder. I just didn't know what your position was as a parent on uh, people being stabbed with butcher knives. Well, we got through Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, so... Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, you you have crossed the Rubicon. (laughs) All right, Joshua, what do you have for ethanol today? All right, Dan, I am excited to be drinking the Rye Pale Ale from Pony Source Brewing in Durham, North Carolina, right here in my town. And Pony Source is doing a drive through beer pickup right now because of the coronavirus quarantine. And what drew me to them was, one, they are a, they are a business I hope does not go out of business, so trying to support them when I can. But they have a really great system where you place your order online, and then you drive by the brewery, and you flash your ID through the window so they can see who you are and that you're of age. You pop the trunk, and they completely submerge your beer order in a sanitizing solution before placing it into your trunk, and then you drive away. Pretty nice. Is the sanitizing solution 70% ethanol? Because that could be a bonus. I don't know. They don't give you any sanitizing solution. You just get a dunk. Uh, Your beer just gets dunked before they put it in. This is a a true fact. Growing up in Pennsylvania, I don't know if this is true anymore, but there were places where you could drive your car into the building. Like you drive actually into the building. They would put beer in your car, and that was the only way to get beer in Pennsylvania. Was that the brew through? Yeah, they weren't allowed to sell it in grocery stores at the time when I was growing up. And so there were beer distributors, and they would... You know, you pull your car in, pop the trunk, and they'd put beer in the back. And it was by the case only, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I never quite understood Pennsylvania beer laws. It's a, it's bizarre. Somebody can correct me who is from Pennsylvania right now and knows how it works, but that's how it used to be. Josh, I have the Longleaf India Pale Ale from Appalachian Mountain Brewery in Boone, North Carolina. Longleaf referring to the Longleaf Pine, of course. And it is not too piney. I was a little afraid. It, it turned out to be okay. Dan, did you pick that beer up at your grocery store? I did. Uh, I don't know if it's just what's available because <laughs> this is what was left on the shelf the same way that I ended up with that white wine last week, but it turned out to be pretty tasty, so I will not complain about this one. 
Well, we are thankful for these beers and also thankful for our friends at Promega. Yeah, Josh, we've talked about the work that they are doing to support scientists at the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you visit promega.com slash hellophd, you'll see some links to uh, some press releases that they have. One of the things I learned today is that they are actually producing some of the qPCR and RT qPCR master mixes that have been approved by the CDC for doing COVID-19 testing. And, you know, the news is just covered with discussion of COVID-19 tests and, and why aren't we doing more of them and how does it work? They have a link there to the CDC's protocol for COVID-19 testing. And I definitely went down a rabbit hole uh, reading through that document. It's really fascinating to see what it takes to do a COVID-19 test with with basically qPCR machines. Yeah. And so if you want to find that link and you're fascinated like we are about the science of how these tests work, you can go to promega.com slash hellophd and you can find some links there about Promega's contributions to the COVID-19 response. And we hope they keep it up and expand it. All right, Dan. Well, today we are joined by a regular guest to the show, Emily Roberts from PF for PhDs, and that is personal finance for PhDs. So it'll be great to talk to Emily again. Let's sit here quietly until she shows up in our Zoom room, Josh. I guess I should say she is coming on the show today to talk with us about everything related to student loans. I think not necessarily about getting more student loans, but how to deal with those pesky undergrad student loans while you're in grad school. Yeah, we'll save the getting more student loans for a different episode in the future. This is about <laughs> how to get rid of them. All right, Emily, it is great to have you back on Hello PhD. Welcome. It's absolutely my pleasure to be back with you. Thank you so much for having me again. Hi, Emily. Are you staying staying safe? You are in Washington State, if I recall correctly, and that is one of the epicenters. That is correct. I live in Seattle. Um, so yes, we were uh, the first wave here in the US. But you know, our government responded pretty quickly and effectively and actually, supposedly, I mean, we're recording this on like April 20th, 2020. So we're supposed to be past the, you know, the peak and our hospital system never got overwhelmed. So I think it was all really well managed. Um, yeah, so I I have felt quite safe. But of course, I have been at home <laughs> quite a lot, almost exclusively over the past six or seven weeks now. So yeah, it's it's definitely a new normal by this point. Yeah, how is the isolation treating you? You have young ones over there, so how's that going? Well, <laughs> it's it's funny because it's kind of a return to what my life was like uh, before we had consistent childcare. So like, I'm caring for the kids like during work hours mostly. I work during nap time, mornings, evenings. My husband keeps his sort of nine to five work schedule from home now instead of going in uh, to the lab. And yeah, so yeah, it's a blow definitely to lose the childcare, but we've done this before. <laughs> we're sort of, it's familiar territory. Um, yeah, and we're having fun, you know, for the kids, but also for me, I've tried to do something special and fun with them um, every weekday. So yeah, like today, for example, we actually broke out, you know, those egg dye kits for like Easter, we didn't use ours <laughs> from like a week or two ago. So we just did that today. So that was our like fun activity. No, that's great. We did that a few days before Easter. But I feel like there's no reason that you couldn't do that any day of the year and have it be fun for the kids. They had a great time. Yeah, they really did. My kids are um, three and one, almost four and two. So they're at a good age. They can play together. I don't have to have my eyes on them every second. So it's hard, but it's like manageable. You know, egg dye doesn't come out of anything, right? Oh, no, <laughs> I haven't tried to do the laundry yet. <laughs> okay, well, just letting you know. Maybe we'll save that for a, a future show. We'll talk about the permanence of egg dye. But today, we want to talk to you, Emily, about something that could be equally scary to some folks out there, and that is student loan repayment. You are you're an expert in this topic, so we are excited to have you on to talk about all things student loans. I don't think that's a topic we've ever covered on the show before. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, although I do want to qualify. I would, I'll say I'm a personal finance expert. I'm comfortable with that. There are ways to be a student loan expert that I am not. Um, actually, one of the sort of 
kinds of people you can go to is called a certified student loan professional. So I don't have that certification, for example, but I'm conversant in student loans for sure. Better better than Josh and I are probably. (laughs) Um, I learned today that a third of adults under age 30 have student loan debt. And the thing that's maybe most interesting to the Hello PhD audience is that the median debt for somebody with a bachelor's degree is $25,000. The median debt for a postgraduate degree holder is $45,000. So this is something that I think really specifically speaks to people who are in graduate school. Yeah, I agree. I think I I didn't uh, go deep into the stats, but I think it was something like of all the outstanding student loans, uh, 40% is is due to graduate you know, student loans being taken out. So it's quite a big chunk of the overall pie. So Emily, before we jump into the details on student loans, I know you've been on Hello PhD a number of times before, but for some listeners who might be newer to the show, just tell us a little bit about who you are and what your interests are and why we brought you here today. Of course, yeah. Um, so again, I'm Dr. Emily Roberts. I have a PhD in biomedical engineering, actually, which I received from Duke University in 2014. And basically since then, I've been running my business, which is personal finance for PhDs. So I help people who are pursuing their PhDs or have PhDs uh, with anything personal finance related. So the two topics that I really love to talk about the most are uh, taxes and investing. And we've already had interviews on Hello PhD on those two topics. So I'd encourage you, the listeners to go back and catch those. But um, student loans are to me not as fun of a topic. So that's why it's taken us until, you know, this <laughs> most recent um, interview to get to them. But it is a super important, you know, aspect of personal finance. So really happy to talk about that. But yeah, through my business, personal finance or PhDs, um, there's lots of ways people can get free content for me. I have a podcast as well. Same name, Personal Finance for PhDs. Um, I also write articles for my website, pfforphds.com. And another major thing I do is I speak at universities. So you may have seen me um, at one of your universities, or certainly I would encourage you if you want to, if you want to see me to uh, get the ball rolling, to uh, have me invited there. So that's another big part of my business. Yeah, that sounds great. We enjoyed having you at our university a couple of years ago. So to, I guess to jump into this topic, could you just walk us through some of the basics about different types of loans? So I know I know there are these federal loans, and I think a lot of our conversation will be a little bit United States-centric today, but um, I know a lot of folks have these federal student loans versus private loans, you know, words like whether a loan's subsidized or unsubsidized. Could you just walk us through some of the terminology we might encounter with regard to loans? Yeah, there's these are really, really important distinctions to make. So if you as an individual listener are unsure of what kinds of student loans you have um, based on the terms that we'll talk about, definitely check with your loan servicer because they're going to have all the details. And it is definitely possible that you can have a mix <laughs> and have some of this type and some of that type. So, you know, one thing you just mentioned is, is federal student loans, um, loans that are given by the federal government um, versus private student loans. So those are student loans that you would obtain through like a private bank, for example. The big difference there is that federal student loans come along with all kinds of benefits that private student loans typically don't. So for example, one of the other terms on this list is um, if your student loans are in deferment versus in repayment. So most lenders offer de- having a deferral with your when you're in graduate school, for example, sometimes if you're in a postdoc. And what that means is that you are not required to make payments during that deferment period. So federal loans definitely offer this, but private loans, it's more like you should really check. They probably do, but it's not certain. And then once you get out of a deferment period, let's say when you finish your PhD and you have a job and you're going into repayment, uh, whether that's federal or private, um, federal student loans have all kinds of um, benefits offered like There's a standard repayment plan, which is just paying off that loan within 10 years, but there's other types of repayment plans that allow you to extend the repayment term uh, to 20 or 25 years, and there's forgiveness options. So we'll go into that a little bit more detail, but those are available for federal student loans. Private student loans, it's more like what you see is what you get. Like you have an interest rate that you're paying with that lender, you have a term, they're much less flexible than the federal government. Federal government also offers like forbearance. So if there's a period of time when, let's say you lose your job and you can't pay, you can explore that. If you have federal student loans, again, private's going to be less flexible. However, in terms of interest rates, because we're in a pretty low interest rate environment right now, usually the private loans have more competitive interest rates, that is lower interest rates than federal student loans, very broadly speaking. Yeah, that's really helpful. And and I did a little bit of research on this. I didn't understand initially that the repayment period tends to be 10 years. 
And that basically what you're saying with being a graduate student or a postdoc is you start that 10-year clock a little bit later. Do you know if the interest is racking up in that time period where you're not paying? Yeah, this is a really crucial question. And this is the difference between a subsidized loan and an unsubsidized loan. So if you took out federal student loans as an undergraduate, for example, chances are that some of them at least will be subsidized. And what that means is that while they're in deferment, during your undergraduate degree, during your graduate degree, perhaps during your, during your postdoc, um, that means the interest will not be accruing if they're subsidized. If they're unsubsidized, what that means is that the interest will accrue. So basically, the actual difference is that in the first case, the subsidized case, the federal government is paying the interest for you um, as you go along. But in the unsubsidized case, that interest is accruing on your loan. You're just not in repayment yet. So the balance that you owe is getting higher and higher and higher until you actually start paying it down. So in that situation, waiting, deferring isn't as if you are not paying anything. It's a, It just means that you are racking up more debt on top of the the actual loan amount because of the number of years that it took to start paying back. Yeah. So in deferment, let's say if you're in graduate school, um, with an unsubsidized loan, the amount you owe is going to be getting higher and higher and higher because that interest is accruing if you're not making any payments. And again, in deferment, you're not required to make payments, but you could if you wanted to. It's it's not off the table. It's just you're not you're not on a schedule that you're required to keep to. Um, and when you get out of a deferment period, if you had unsubsidized student loans, the interest, it, the term is capitalizes. So it becomes part of the new principle of the loan when it comes out of deferment. And that's how your new payments will be calculated going forward with all that original principle, plus the interest that has now become part of the principle. So your payments will be even higher than, let's say, when you were exiting your undergraduate degree. If you looked at the balance then versus you look at the balance after your graduate deferment period, it'll be higher and your payments will be higher. So it's, it can be pretty scary if that interest rate was you know, sizable. Well, and you've worked with quite a few students, Emily, on on budgeting, like a simple topic that we've talked about before, but something that's really powerful for students is creating a budget. Have you seen some budgets from PhDs who do have some student debt? And can you ballpark us what kind of, of monthly numbers we're talking about to start paying back this debt over 10 years? That is a very hard question, I understand. <laughs> she wasn't it prepared for really that question, question, Dan. I just don't know if it's $1,000 a month or if it's $50 a month. I just don't know what, what range we're talking about here. It could be either. Yeah. I mean, it could be over $1,000 a month for sure with that, standard, that right? re- with a standard repayment plan if you have a quite a high student balance. Do you want me to pull out a calculator and give you some numbers? I'll, I'll mention a couple of resources. So one for calculators that I really like is called Student Loan Hero. And another really good one is Student Loan Planner. So I'm going to pull up the Student Loan Hero calculator because they have a really nice one that compares across different repayment plans. Let's do let's do forty five k. That's the uh, median. Forty five is the median, yeah. and then I'll have my my boundaries much higher and much lower. So your income doesn't matter on the standard repayment plan, but it does for some of these income driven repayment plans, which we haven't brought up yet. <laughs> um, so let's say if you had forty five thousand uh, dollar student loan balance at a five point seven percent interest, that payment for for one month is a four hundred ninety two dollar payment, um, and that's for over ten years. So ultimately, on that forty-five, that is significant. Yeah, that's substantial. Yeah. <laughs> so on that forty-five thousand dollars of debt that you came out of graduate school with, ultimately over that ten years, if you only pay, ever paid the minimum, you would pay a little over fifty-nine thousand dollars total. So a little over fourteen thousand dollars just in interest if you stuck with that standard repayment plan. Ouch. Yeah. So these are the kinds of numbers we are talking like hundreds of dollars a month easily on a standard repayment plan. So Emily, one one thing you mentioned was that during these deferment periods, and, and that's something that you know, just seemed to be a standard thing. I remember when I was going through grad school and have conversations a lot with current grad students, that it's almost a no-brainer. Everyone's thinking about, everyone with student loans is thinking about deferring those loans while they're in graduate school. And you know, one question I had was, are there ever terms of loans where you are penalized for making payments during the deferment process? Or is that something you're always free to do um, even if your loans are in deferral, is to to make payments without worrying about somehow canceling the deferment. So I agree that I, I the deferment happens fairly automatically when you go into graduate school. I do think you're going to be submitting some form somewhere with your servicer that says, hey, I'm going to graduate school, put me in deferment. And no, I don't think that making a payment here or there is going to somehow override that status. That said, I 
would not put anything past a student loan servicer. Like you have to be really on top of them, especially if you're pursuing something like public service loan forgiveness, which we'll talk about again in a moment. But you have to stay really on top to make sure that all your payments are being recorded properly. They have all your paperwork in place. So I I wouldn't say it's like a set it and forget it situation. Um, If you're making payments and you don't have to be, it will, it is a good idea to check up every few months. Okay. Are my payments payments being recorded? Am I still in deferment? Just check on it. I don't think anything, you know, terrible would happen, but but these loan servicers tend to be a little disorganized. Is there any reason not to defer your loans? Or is that pretty much an automatic thing you should absolutely be looking into if you're pursuing some kind of graduate program? Yeah, my standard advice for people is to go ahead and defer when you're in graduate school. Uh, Not to say that you can't make payments if you want to, but it's a great idea to not be forced into making payments because let's say if you had, you know, a a manageable size of student loan debt, you're okay with making the payments. It would be okay to not defer. But then if there was ever a month when you didn't want to or couldn't make the payment for some reason, if you were not in deferment, you would still be obligated to. And if you have that deferment option, it just gives you more flexibility. So I do think it's a good idea to defer, um, even if you still want to be making payments. Yeah. So along the lines of of making payments during graduate school. I mean, I do agree with you. I think the flexibility of knowing that you can, if you want to, but you're not forced into it is a nice thing, especially when your, your income stream is likely to be lower than it will be postgraduate school, hopefully. So what, what advice would you have for grad students about how to balance wanting to repay or wanting to pay some on their student loans during grad school with other financial goals they might have, like starting to get involved in investing or paying down other debts. Uh, What advice do you have there? Yeah, this is a question that I love to sink my teeth into. And over the past year, I've developed kind of my own framework for answering this question. So something specific to personal finance for PhDs. Um, And so in my framework, um, you'll be balancing sort of three types of goals. One is saving up cash. So I definitely want people to be comfortable with the amount of cash they have on hand, their cash flow, you know, their income minus their expenses, and also having a bit of an emergency fund, some uh, cash for short-term savings, because we know like for graduate students, especially with kind of low income, lower cash flow situation, there can be some large expenses that come up that really bust your budget. So I want you to have accounted for those. Balancing that, saving up cash with paying off debt and with investing. And so when you're thinking about which of these things to do first, um, in my framework, we start with step one is a starter emergency fund, a baby emergency fund. Um, step two is paying off what I call high high priority debt. So that usually means high interest rates. So like credit cards, for example, typically high interest rate debt. If you have debt with the IRS, um, for instance, if you you know didn't um, make your quarterly estimated tax payments for your fellowship and then you have to pay that off you know with a payment plan with the IRS, that to me is also high priority debt. So things like that. Student loans would not necessarily fall into high priority in my framework. Um, certainly not if they're deferred, but Also, if they're just uh, not at a super high interest rate, which in my framework is somewhere between six and eight percent is like above that would be considered high, high priority. So student loans often have, you know, six percent, five percent kind of interest rate range. So to me, they're usually not high priority. After that, more saving up for cash, as I mentioned earlier, short term expenses. Then I like to push people towards investing to start investing for retirement. And so it really just depends on what interest rate those student loans um, are at. So they might come after that starting to invest for retirement if they're below this like six to eight percent kind of range. And what also matters in this is not just like the math of, okay, what exactly is the interest rate of you know your debt versus what kind of return can you get in the market? It also matters kind of how you feel about the fact that you have student loan debt or other types of debt or how excited you are about investing. And I think that should play into your decision as well. If you can't sleep very well at night knowing that you have this large outstanding amount of student loans, then that should be your priority. That should weigh into it becoming a priority for you for paying them down. So, you know, it's, it's a vague answer because because it is really individual, but I do think there's a place for saving up cash, there's a place for investing, and there's a place for repaying debt, whether that's student loans or other kinds of debt. But I don't think student loans should automatically take you know precedence over everything else. There are other good things you can do with your money. I mean, I imagine one thing that could factor in too is utilizing these tools that you, you mentioned earlier, where maybe students could run their own numbers and say, all right, well, you know, if I threw $100 a month at my student loans, for the five years or four years I'm in graduate school, this is the impact that's going to have on my repayment 
after I get out of grad school. And you may see how significant that is and how that makes you feel of whether you think that $100 a month might be better used elsewhere while you're in grad school. Exactly. Um, I think with student loans being deferred in graduate school, it's for many people, it's an out of sight, out of mind kind of situation. Okay, I don't have to make payments, so I'm just not going to look at it ever. That is not a route that I would recommend, even if you aren't going to be making payments, just kind of keeping a, you know, keeping track of things, keeping track of the pulse of that, knowing how fast that interest is accruing is a really good idea. Even if you're decided, even if you've decided against making payments, you just need to know what you're, you know, balancing that off against. Okay, I'm not going to be making payments. Payments on my student loans right now. I know they're accruing interest at XYZ rate, but instead I'm going to be doing this other really good thing with my money, whether that's saving up cash or whether it's investing. Um, I will go back to one of the terms we talked about earlier, subsidized and unsubsidized. So during that deferment period, if you have subsidized student loans, they're effectively at a 0% interest rate. So to me, in my framework, those are not a priority for being paid down ahead of schedule. Um, That is ahead of them coming out of deferment. But if they are unsubsidized and they are accruing interest, that should weigh in a little bit differently. Yeah, that makes sense. Emily, as you talk about some of the the ways that you're balancing different goals, financial goals as a graduate student. I would like to note that interest rates right now are very, very low for houses, for uh, bank accounts. You know, people are not making a lot of money on money they're putting in their bank account. So if I have a student loan, is this a good time to think about refinancing or is that going to cause me problems down the road? Uh, I think it's an excellent time to think about refinancing, to explore refinancing. So, Tell us what refinancing (laughs) is in case people (laughs) have not had that experience yet. Yeah. So refinancing is basically just when you take out a new student loan and you pay off your old student loan with that new student loan. And ideally, you would be doing this because your new student loan is at a lower interest rate than your old student loan. So if you took out student loans when interest rates were a little bit higher, now they're lower. I mean, the Fed has cut interest rates quite recently. So, you know, there could be very low, very competitive rates available right now when we're speaking. Um, so it, it could, it's always a great time to explore refinance and student loans. The pothole that graduate students could hit with this process is that to refinance your student loans into a, into a private student loan, you are giving up, if you're starting with federal and refinancing into private, which is what this process means, um, you're giving up those potential federal benefits of like income-driven repayment plans and forbearance and such. So you have to know really, really sure that you're not going to be using those advantages and you'd rather take the lower interest rate that the private students or loans are offering you. So that's a that's a very serious consideration. So it's a, it's a very, very serious step to take federal student loans and refinance them into private. Um, it can be very advantageous for some people, but it's just a decision that's worth a lot of consideration. So it's not one size fits all. It's not a guarantee that a lower rate is a better thing. No, not at all. Especially if you're talking about you know going an income-driven repayment route or public student loan forgiveness, um, that should all weigh into this. But another thing that can happen with re- refinance into private student loans is that you need a really good like credit profile to do this. So you need a steady job that's giving you regular paychecks. You need a good credit score. Um, you need to have a relatively low debt to income ratio. So your total amount of student loan debt that you are refinancing versus the amount of income you have. And the requirement to have a low debt to income ratio, and by low, I mean, usually like two to one or one to one, that is difficult if you have a low graduate student stipend at the moment. So a lot of people, even if they're so, so sure that they want to refinance, they may not be able to do that during graduate school. It may have to wait until you have that higher income post PhD. Well, I think that's a good lead in to talking a little bit now about the repayment process. And you've mentioned some of these terms already in our conversation today. And these are certain programs I've heard mentioned before. But tell us a little bit more about these income driven repayment plans for the federal loans. And also something that I know I've heard of uh, public service loan forgiveness. What are those and who might be eligible for for those types of plans? Yeah, this is something that everyone who has federal student loans should become versed in. Um, So with with the standard repayment plan that we mentioned earlier for federal student loans, that's just, you know, you repay over 10 years. That's the standard term. It's at whatever interest rate you've been given. That's the standard thing. The federal government also offers what are called income driven repayment uh, programs, and they usually involve a degree of forgiveness of your debt. 
And so this was sort of designed for people who were having a lot of trouble making those standard repayments. You know, as we mentioned earlier, it could be hundreds of dollars per month. Um, That can be a shock to your budget. And so for people who are having trouble making those standard repayments, all these other programs were created. And there's like sort of an alphabet soup of different programs that have been created over time. Um, For instance, there's the the repay plan. So R-E-P-A-Y-E. That's a that's called revised pay as you earn. That's a play off of the older pay as you earn repayment plan, P-A-Y-E. There's income based repayment, there's income contingent repayment. So there's a lot of different options. And what happens with these is that your your term of your loans is extended from 10 years to 20 or 25 years, depending on what the plan is. So you're stretching out that loan repayment over a longer period of time, which allows them to lower the actual payment that you make. And your payment is in these income-driven repayment programs, your your payment is calculated based off of your income. So depending on the exact plan, um, there are you know different variables in here, but it's usually a percentage of your income above a multiple of the federal poverty level for your family size. So yeah, it gets like really complicated. It's helpful to use a calculator when you're trying to compare these different plans. But the basic idea is you're lowering your payment, but you're extending the payment term. And for these programs, you can get loan forgiveness at the end of the payment term. So after you've made your 20 or 25 years of you know the payments that are dictated by like the calculator, then you would have the remainder of the loan, if there is any remainder, forgiven uh, by the federal government. And so that's, that's a, a good option, a, a nice option to have if you are struggling to make those payments at the standard level. Now, what's actually kind of exciting and applies to a lot of PhDs is when you combine one of these income-driven repayment plans with public service loan forgiveness, or PSLF, as it's commonly called. So PSLF was first introduced, I want to say it was like in 2007, 2008 kind of time frame. And so what happens with that is you make these lower payments on one of these longer term plans. But instead of taking 20 or 25 years before you get to forgiveness, forgiveness comes after 10 years. But you have to work for a certain kind of employer. So a nonprofit or a government type employer. So if you're working for a university, this would apply for you. So you're in public service, right? So the idea is that you're taking a presum- you know, presumptively lower salary because you're working in public service and the government's going to give you some help out with that by you know forgiving some of your student loans, perhaps. So it's only 10 years of repayment. You have to make those payments, you know, perfectly on time and and everything in the full amount. Um, 10 years of repayments. And then the forgiveness comes at the end of that uh, length of time. Does a postdoc count? Do I have to be a faculty member? What does it mean to be in public service at a university? Yeah. So for a postdoc, I think it would depend on whether you're a postdoc employee or a postdoc not employee. (laughs) But I think if you're an employee, you would be able to start that clock. Um, I'm not sure if you're not an employee, whether that would count or not. Yeah, I, I that may be like a situation by situation. Yeah, that makes sense. But do I have to apply for this? Or somebody just gives this to me for being a good person? You do have to apply, but the good thing is that it's it's kind of retroactive. So like if you realize a few years down the road that you should have been going towards PSLF, you can, as long as you get all the property documentation from your previous employers, you can sort of apply that time that you'd been making those payments for uh, to the ongoing program. So it's actually that you apply at like the end of the 10-year period, um, but you have to have all your ducks in a row for all your documentation to show that you've been working for qualifying employers for that entire time. And of course, you've been making all your payments payments on time and everything. That's very exciting. Yeah, it can be a really, really great program um, for people who have, you know, higher slash unmanageably high um, levels of student loan debt. Or of course, if you just want to work for that kind of employer anyway, um, and would be going, you know, for a job at university, that's your, that's what your heart desires. And if you get that, then this, this can be a good option to look into. Um, I kind of like to think about student loan repayment as being you're either going to go on like the fast track or on the slow track. And they're both okay in different situations, but it really pays to commit to one or the other. So the slow track is, you know, enrolling in one of these income driven repayment options, income driven repayment plans, and then ideally pairing that with PSLF. So the end of the repayment comes after 10 years instead of 20 or 25 years. That's the slow route. And in that route, if you are gunning for PSLF um, or committed to one of these income driven repayment programs, Uh, you should only 
ever make the minimum payments on those student loans. It does not work to your advantage to go any higher above the minimums because you have that forgiveness coming at the end of the process or you presume that it's coming at the end of the process. That's the slow track. So basically in that track, you know, you're going to commit to it and you're only going to ever make the minimum payments. On the fast track, that's when you could be considering something like refinancing because you've said to yourself, I'm not going down the slow route. I'm not pursuing PSLF. I'm not pursuing income driven repayment plan. I'm just going to pay my loans off as fast as I can, given what we said earlier about balancing that with investing and some other goals that you may have. But you're going to pursue that more aggressively. So ideally, in that, in that case, you'd be paying off the loans um, you know, above the minimums. You'd be paying off in less than 10 years. Yeah. So there's kind of the fast track and the slow track. And it's not a good idea to like flip between the two of these a whole lot. And I imagine some of this is driven by personal factors such as the amount of student debt that you have, the amount of balance that you have, and then also the type of income that you're looking at postgraduate school. I imagine those two factors could weigh heavily on your decision. Yeah, so it's it's hard to find like firm like rules about who should be considering what, but I did find some rules of thumb that I think it's it's good to sort of get you thinking about it. So, again, thinking about your your post PhD income and then that that debt balance that you have in student loans. Um, if you have a debt to income ratio above two to one, you're probably in a decent spot for considering um, an income driven repayment plan, whether that comes with PSLF or not. If you have a debt to income ratio between one to one and two to one, and you have PSLF available to you, that might be a good option. Or maybe going the fast track is a good option. And below a debt to income ratio of one to one, mm, you should probably be pursuing that fast track option and just paying your loans off as quickly as you can and not trying to pursue one of these you know, slower plans. There is a potential trap that you can fall into when it comes to income or driven income driven repayment plans. And I don't want anyone listening to this to fall into this trap. And here's what it is. Um, You sign up for an income driven repayment plan. You lower that payment. That feels good. You have more cash flow available to you every month. You just continue to make that minimum, that minimum payment over that 20 to 25 year period, especially if it's not combined with public service loan forgiveness that can stretch on for a long time. That's part of the trap. The other part of it is thinking to yourself, well, I still have student loans. I can't start investing. I can't do other things with my finances. I can't buy a house. I can't X, Y, Z, move on with your life in other ways because you still have those student loans. So you've extended that repayment plan and you've also, and also at the same time, you're not putting energy into other areas of your finances. That's the trap. So the slow route is okay, but while you're going that slow route and expecting on that forge- expecting that forgiveness at the end of the process, don't neglect the other areas of your finances. You should be putting a lot of energy into repaying other types of debt you might have and starting to invest and building up cash and maybe you know buying a home. You should still be putting a lot of energy there. So don't fall into the trap of, I, I can't do anything else in my life because I have student loans still, but I'm going to have student loans for X many decades. Yeah, I think the temptation is to view that slow path as kicking the can down the road and just still living paycheck to paycheck and not making any advance on some of your other goals. And I think that's a great reminder to people, this is a tool you can use, but it doesn't mean uh, that you don't do investing in other ways and taking care of other debts that are on your plate so that you can be prepared for the future. That's a very, very good way to put it. And I think you also need to ask yourself, like, if you are or were struggling to make the minimum payment on the standard 10-year repayment plan, and you chose, you know, to go for the income driven repayment route, you really need to evaluate, like, do you have a a student loan problem? Like your student loan balance is hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yes, it would be crushing to anybody. Or do you have an income problem, frankly? And is the income what you need to fix in your in your personal finances first, so that you can then speed up the student loan payment, speed up the progress that you're making in other areas of your finances? How do you solve an income problem? Is that another (laughs) show? I think that's a series of shows. That's another expert to talk to. (laughs) If I want to talk to somebody about this, Emily, are you a good person to talk to about my finances and my goals and my career? And and how do we get in touch? Yes, of course. I would love to talk with people about um, all these goals that they're trying to balance. So for me, if you want to work with me, a good place to go is my website, pfforphds.com slash coaching. 
and you can sign up for like an introductory call with me just to see if we're a good fit for each other. Aside from me, and I would love to, of course, work with PhDs, but if you're looking for someone who more specializes in like these different repayment plans, I mentioned earlier that certified student, a certified student loan professional could be a good um, fit. Your loan servicer is also a, just a really good place to go to to figure out exactly what kinds of loans there are. They probably have calculators there to help you figure out, well, is this plan better for me or is this plan better for me? So there's a lot you can DIY on this. And I want to mention a couple other resources. One is Student Loan Hero, another Student Loan Planner. Those are websites. Um, They have, again, calculators like this. Student Loan Planner specializes in um, sort of consulting with people who have high levels of student loan debt. So I think they're more thinking of like the doctor lawyer type of people. But certainly if you have a large student loan balance and you're on a PhD track, that might be a good fit for you. And I'll mention one more name, which is Heather Jarvis. And she, like me, um, does speaks at universities and also consults with individuals specifically on student loans. Um, And she specializes in people who have graduate degrees. Wow, this is great. I learned so much. And I think this is going to be so helpful for people who are staring down (laughs) student loans and not quite sure what to do or are just overwhelmed by not having the information they feel like they need to make an informed decision for themselves. Just real quick, one more time. I know you did at the beginning, but just tell us the best way that people could get in touch with you. Yeah, the best way to get in touch with me is is through my website. So pf for phds.com, pfforphds.com. And you can just email me. My email address is emily at pf for phds.com. That's the best way to reach me. And we can have a conversation and figure out what the next step should be for you, whether it's coaching with me or with someone else, or I can point you to resources if that's what's best. So I would love to have those conversations. Emily, thanks so much for, for jumping on the show again. I've lost track of how many times we've had you on. Oh, I'm ready with this, Josh. I'm ready with this. You use the handy search bar? Episode 033 to find our episode with Emily about tax season and about what you need to know. Although that was in 2016, so things probably have changed. They have. Uh, <laughs> so disregard that we'll, one. We'll talk to you again, Emily. <laughs> episode 68 is how to use a targeted savings account. Emily talked about what to do about re- irregular expenses and having that kind of rainy day fund. So episode 68 will teach you about that. And then uh, the Grad Student's Guide to Investing for Retirement, episode 89. And, and that's where we talked about uh, how you can be investing even as a graduate student to, to use that time value of money, compounding interest to make yourself feel very good at the end of a, a number of years. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I I think all the episodes we've done together have been excellent. I'm so glad you've had me on so many times to share this information with your listeners. Well, I know I always learn something. And if you want to hear more from Emily, you can check out her podcast, Personal Finance for PhDs. All right. Well, this was a great topic that I know is going to be interesting to a lot of our listeners. But if you have a question or topic idea you would like for us to discuss on the show, we would love to hear it. You can email us, podcast at hellophd.com. Send us a tweet at Hello PhD. And if you like the show, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We love getting your feedback. If you would like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, click the Become a Patron button, or visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We would love the beer money. And now that we are recording separately, we need twice as many beers. So thanks to the ongoing support from all of our patrons. It's really the same number of beers, Josh. Technically, each of us would have one. Feels like more. (laughs) Okay. Emily, Dan, stay safe, and uh, we'll be back at you with another episode soon. We'll see you then. Bye.